Uh, so I'd like to introduce Panayotis Murticopoulos, uh, who's a professor, uh, 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 a researcher at CNRS and uh, University of Grenoble and Critel Labs. And is connected today from some prestigious university in Europe with a very beautiful uh, library. But I can take it away. Thanks, Kosti. Actually, as I recently learned, uh, this is uh, uh, the beautiful library that you see is uh, Montreal, so not Europe, but uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for the kind introduction. Thanks a lot for inviting me and uh, for putting together this uh, very exciting workshop. And uh, of course, as you may have noticed, uh, there has been a change of, uh, of uh, schedule since uh, Nishith was supposed to uh, speak uh, uh, right now. But uh, for, uh, for me, it was actually quite serendipitous because uh, the, what I want to talk about today uh, uh, dovetails uh, quite well with uh, uh, the previous uh, talk by Manolis, uh, because I also want to explore um, in this talk, the limits of uh, min-max uh, optimization algorithms, not from the point of view of uh, complexity theory, but uh, from the point of view of dynamical systems. And uh, it's not so much that we're trying to, I don't want to uh, establish a lower uh, complexity bounds like in uh, Manoli's talk. Uh, what I want to do is I want to examine some of the standard algorithms that we use in practice and to see what kind of uh, behavior uh, emerges in the log run, what are their asymptotic convergence properties and uh, all that. Um, so uh, since uh, I'm not, uh, I'm lucky enough not to be in the first day of the uh, workshop, I will just skip everything that has to do with motivation, why we're interested in min-max optimization. If you're in the room, you probably know why you're interested. And uh, I'll uh, go directly into one of the most uh, popular playgrounds that we've uh, 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 that we're using to test uh, uh, our algorithms and to develop new ones. And this is a figure that you've probably seen uh, at least a couple of times. I'm pretty sure we'll see it at least uh, three or four times uh, until this workshop is over and has to do with uh, this very simple uh, min-max optimization problem. Uh, uh, min max x y x one x two here, uh, and the the uh, um, and the standard gradient descent descent algorithm, vanilla gradient algorithm, and uh, the way that it uh, diverges, uh, which is something that also uh, Yang Chai uh, uh, spoke about uh, talked about yesterday. The reason being that so when you do a gradient descent uh, on this very simple uh, problem. Uh, you are always taking a, st a step along the, um, along the tangent, which then forces you to spiral outwards. And uh, as uh, Yang uh, also uh, explained, this, was also, this is uh, the birthplace, uh, this was the birthplace of, uh, of other algorithms like extra gradient, the extra gradient algorithm, and, uh, the, uh, and the Popov's version, uh, which is uh, nowadays called the optimistic gradient algorithm, which uh, take an extra step or they interpolate this extra gradient step from previous observations and so manage to change this, um, this divergent landscape that we have for a gradient descent ascent into uh, a very nice uh, convergence inward uh, uh, spiral and convergent uh, sequence. All right. So uh, all this, all this is something. Uh, all these are things that you've uh, uh, that you've seen uh, many times over. Nothing new here. Uh, what I want to say is that uh, it is precisely of this huge disparity in the behavior of uh, standard gradient descent uh, ascent algorithm and uh, its extra gradient or optimistic gradient versions that uh, we've been using this very simple min-max uh, problem this, uh, uh, and more generally all the bilinear, uh, the setting of bilinear min-max optimization problems, basically as a testing ground to, uh, for new algorithms. So uh, whenever there is an algorithmic idea, we uh, try, at least it is quite common to try it out on this game uh, see how it improves behavior and then expand on this, uh, build on, uh, on any improvement, uh, improvements that are observed and uh, hopefully uh, get better and uh, uh, better performance guarantees in more general problems than simply bilinear games. 
So um, what I want to start um, discussing is what happens if we are in a more uh, ML oriented setting where we don't have access to uh, perfect gradients. When we start uh, using stochastic gradients and we only have access to the gradient uh, field of, the, uh, of, of our min-max objective via a stochastic first order oracle. All right, so in this case, if we just take the very same algorithms, then this very uh, nice uh, this, uh, dichotomy between uh, the divergence of standard vanilla gradient algorithms and the convergence of their extra gradient uh, siblings uh, breaks down. And uh, in fact, okay, so I see that slide doesn't change for some reason. Hmm. Okay. Right, okay, so that's the right slide. So uh, as I was saying, if, you on, if we only have access to, uh, stochastic, to a stochastic uh, first order oracle, then uh, the behavior of uh, these three algorithms now becomes very difficult to tell apart. Uh, and I uh, claim that you know, if you're looking at this or this or this uh, uh, image, it is basically impossible to tell whether one has been generated by an extra gradient or a, or a gradient, uh, standard gradient algorithm. And, uh, there have been uh, significant efforts to correct this uh, failure of convergence in the stochastic setting, uh, either by uh, via iterate averaging. So instead of looking at the last iterate of the method to uh, look at uh, an appropriate uh, ergodic or time average or stochastic average, uh, this is uh, this is sometimes referred to in the literature as uh, Polya-Kruppert averaging, and uh, uh, it is very, uh, very successful in the realm of convex concave problems. But uh, if we are beyond this, uh, if we're beyond this regime and we're really interested in the convergence of the last iterate of the, of the method, then we need some, uh, some mechanism with which to mitigate the noise that enters, uh, that enters the process. And uh, for this, there are either, either uh, approaches based on uh, variance reduction. Uh, Tatiana Chavdarova and her co authors have uh, a very nice uh, paper in Europe's uh, describing exactly that. Or uh, you can find a sort of fine tune uh, the algorithms a little bit and uh, play with the step sizes and introduce, for instance, a double step size uh, variant of, uh, of extra gradient where you have uh, a different step size for controlling the step with which you explore the landscape, the min-max landscape, and the different, much smaller uh, step size with which you are actually updating the base state uh, of the algorithm. And uh, if, you, uh, if you control the two appropriately, if you explore much more aggressively than you update, uh, then uh, you get uh, again, uh, even in the stochastic case, uh, a convergent uh, uh, a convergence result uh, for the methods uh, last uh, last iterate. All right. So um, to sum up, uh, what I want to say so far is that in the deterministic case, we have this uh, very important, I call it, very significant dichotomy between convergent and non-convergent uh, first order methods, which is lost in the stochastic case, unless we do some very special uh, tricks to somehow uh, recover it. And uh, the reason I'm calling these tricks uh, somehow special is that this image that I described is actually uh, extremely fragile. Uh, what do I mean by that? That if we take this original, uh, uh, first of all, uh, if we take this original bilinear game and we perturb it a little bit and we go a bit beyond the bilinear case, and this is something that we would like to do because uh, at least in ML, we would, be we would like to apply these uh, algorithms and these methods to uh, problems that are in no way, shape or form uh, convex concave. So if we do this, if we take just the original min-max, uh, bilinear min-max problem, and we add a very small, an epsilonic perturbation, then the entire landscape that I described before uh, collapses. And what happens is that instead of, uh, of even in the deterministic case, instead of having this uh, 
difference between the divergent gradient method and the, con the convergent extra gradient or, uh, or optimistic gradient or double step size extra gradient or what have you extra gradient method. Here, by the, if you just consider a slightly perturbed game, then all convergence bets are off. And all these algorithms, you can show that they actually converge to, uh, to an attracting limit cycle, which is sort of a universal trap for all these algorithms. And uh, uh, something which is significant is that in contrast to uh, the, uh, the bilinear case where uh, there was also a sharp distinction between deterministic and stochastic and the stochastic regime. Here, in the, uh, when we are outside of the, this bilinear sandbox, uh, the difference between deterministic and stochastic uh, algorithms is much less pronounced. So uh, if you take the same algorithms and you apply them to the same game, but you just have access to stochastic gradients, not deterministic gradients, then you see this, the same long-term behavior um, in the limit, of course, uh, in both the deterministic and stochastic case. Namely, all of these algorithms converge spiral with some fluctuations, of course, due to the noise to the same limit cycle. All right. And uh, so if I were to sum up again here, you see that when we are out of the bilinear world, in fact, when we are out of the monotone world, uh, we no longer have this uh, this fine distinction where uh, more sophisticated uh, first order methods might lead to better or different ad outcomes. And this even for arbitrarily small perturbations of our uh, original uh, minimax uh, objective. And also that it turns out that stochasticity plays here a much less important role than it does in the context of, uh, of uh, uh, bilinear minimax games, uh, which should not be interpreted that uh, uh, in the sense that stochasticity somehow uh, becomes benign and uh, decides to help us in the, uh, the non-monotone regime. No, it is just that the, uh, deterministic, uh, 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 the deterministic framework becomes more difficult. And this, it is this difficulty, uh, these inherent difficulties for uh, non-monotone min-max optimization problems that I want to discuss and to try to understand why uh, this uh, landscape, why do all these uh, uh, phenomena uh, occur and uh, whether we can somehow uh, systematize their, uh, their study. And uh, uh, so if I were to uh, stop with the, um, before jumping into the details of the talk, uh, then the overall objective would be to understand precisely what is the long run behavior of first order methods in uh, non-linear, uh, non-monotone uh, min-max games. And uh, just as Manolis was saying uh, in uh, the talk right before, uh, I want to explore uh, the gulf between minimization problems where these same first order uh, algorithms are known to converge to components of critical points and to also avoid uh, saddle points in one way or another. And I would like to examine the same type of questions in the context of min-max optimization, namely whether uh, to see whether gradient methods always, whether it is possible for gradient methods to always converge to critical points, and uh, what are the possible limit sets that might arise uh, in this uh, context. And uh, I should of course say that this is uh, not uh, just, um, uh, um, this, uh, has, this talk will actually contain um, a range of results uh, from, uh, from, some, uh, from a number of papers uh, where the unifying viewpoint is exactly uh, that of the theory of dynamical systems. Uh, which will allow us to uh, go from discrete to continuous time and uh, then uh, and uh, back again and uh, study continuous time dynamical systems and then build a dictionary with which we can uh, uh, regain uh, some sort of uh, some semblance of convergence uh, in the discrete time setting. Um, so yeah, of course, uh, this, as I was saying, this was not uh, 
Uh, this has been uh, a research thread that we've been pursuing with uh, a number of uh, colleagues from uh, from Switzerland, France, and uh, and the States and uh, Singapore. Sorry, George. And uh, so let me jump right into the actual uh, theory and uh, the actual math. And uh, I can't um, uh, I can't stress enough that I want this to be. Uh, as uh, um, open-ended as possible. So please, if you have any, uh, any sort of questions or uh, you want to throw any sort of stones, this is what these slides are designed for. So please don't hesitate. All right, yeah. Uh, probably this, uh, that would be sure about the model uh, until now, all the noise that you described about the positive, even for the positive results in the mean max by linear case, what are the characteristics of noise, even roughly? Wait to slides, because oh, I haven't okay. discussed you, you the model. The right. That okay. was all background. All right. So, so uh, exactly. So, uh, two, uh, two problems uh, we will discuss. Uh, minimization problems, min-max problems. Uh, for most of the talk, I will be assuming uh, I will be assuming that our uh, feasible region, our domain, our state space, is uh, the entire uh, all of our D. Uh, this is basically just to simplify the presentation. Most of what I'm going to uh, I'm going to say also holds for the constraint setting, uh, but some of the statements are a bit more uh, complicated to state, but to write down, not conceptually. So for most of the talk, uh, things will be uh, unconstrained. And uh, as for the uh, blanket assumptions for, uh, for, our, for the type of objectives that we will consider, uh, we will uh, consider both uh, deterministic ones, but also stochastic ones, which are the expectations of some uh, random function uh, uh, defined over some complete probability space. The, uh, the main difficulty here is, we, as I said, we're not going to be assuming any convex structure for the function, which means that also that uh, f is difficult to manipulate in closed form. So uh, everything will be in the black box setting, no white box results like in the previous talk. And uh, we will focus throughout on uh, finding uh, critical points. So critical points are those for which the defining the associated vector field of the function, which is either its gradient field or its min max gradient field uh, vanishes. So are all these things, are all these points desirable? Absolutely not, absolutely not. But uh, if it so happens that we cannot even find these type of points, then we're in big trouble. All right. Uh, so uh, that's about all uh, for the basic setup. And in terms uh, of uh, blanket assumptions, as I said, uh, we will be uh, mostly working with uh, unconstrained uh, problems in terms of uh, uh, statements. Uh, just to avoid trivialities, we will assume that uh, the problem always admits a solution on empty critical set. And we will also assume uh, Lipschitz continuity and smoothness uh, for, uh, for the objective function. Again, these, uh, these results, oh, sorry, these assumptions can be tweaked and they can be uh, fine-tuned to get uh, stronger or, uh, or weaker in some cases results. Uh, but these are very comf comfortable assumptions to work with and they simplify the presentation. So that's uh, what I'm gonna use throughout. Okie doc. So in terms of algorithms, which I, I want to discuss again, a class of algorithms very quickly before discussing the Oracle to address Manolo's question. Uh, first type of algorithm we'll consider is simple gradient ascent. So we are at the given point, we get, we query uh, an Oracle, we get, uh, our, uh, we get our gradient and then we take a step. Another algorithm that we would like to consider is the backward analog of this of this uh, of the of uh, standard gradient this, uh, of standard gradient methods, namely proximal point, where uh, in order to make an update, you need to solve uh, an implicit fixed point equation to calculate the gradient at the point at which you would end up with. So this is an implicit, in general, non-implementable method. Um, 
but also it's first order approximant, which is, uh, or rather I should say, yeah, first order approximant, depends on how you count orders, uh, which is the extra gradient algorithm where you start for a point with a point, you get a, you make a gradient query, you uh, calculate a leading state, then based on this leading state, you get a new gradient and you transport this gradient back to your original point and you take your update. All right, extra gradient, optimistic gradient, you do the same thing. It's only that instead of calculating a gradient here, you take the gradient, the last gradient that you observe and you use this to do this extra update, all right? And of course, there is a bunch of other algorithms that will fall, uh, that, uh, that are being used in practice and we would also like to analyze with a sort of unified umbrella. Uh, such as, for instance, uh, alternating algorithms where uh, first one player updates, then another player updates, and so players update sequentially. Or uh, if we go back to uh, the original paper on GANs uh, and we check out the specific instantiation of gradient descent, what was done there is we have a, a, what is known as a K1 update where one player performs K updates for the other players one. And uh, again, uh, then the sky's the limit. I mean, there is a huge literature on, uh, on first order algorithms uh, you, uh, that uh, have been developed to solve uh, minimax optimization problems uh, from Shambhal Pock, uh, step size uh, scaling methods, methods with variance reduction, and then combinations of all, of all the above. You basically take uh, a bunch of Lego pieces, you, uh, you lay them on the floor, depending on what is the construct and what is the specific uh, problem that you want to solve. You combine your Legos and you get uh, a new algorithm with uh, potentially new properties. So now, Finally, to answer Manoli's question and to provide the sort of unif unifying umbrella of algorithms that we'd like to study, these are all algorithms that fall within the generalized Robbins-Monroe template. What does this mean? Uh, it means that uh, all we, we will consider all algorithms that can be written in this general form, where V of Xn is the gradient field at the state in question, Un is some zero mean noise. So, so far this is just stochastic gradient. But the novelty here is that we uh, also consider uh, an additional bias term, a, uh, an, an extra term which might, uh, which is not necessarily uh, zero mean. Uh, it might not even be stochastic, uh, all right. And this bias term uh, is what measures, is uh, the measure of difference, so, uh, so to speak, of this of the generic robbins monroe algorithm from the vanilla gradient descent. So in the case of gradient descent ascent, we have exactly this formulation with, uh, with bias equal to zero. Uh, in the proximal point method, we have, uh, again, a generalized robbins monroe algorithm with the bias being the implicit minus the explicit gradient. And uh, in the extra gradient case, we have Again, a robbins monroe method with the bias being the difference between the, uh, <clears throat> between the uh, leading state gradient and the base state gradient, and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, this, uh, this, method, this template is actually uh, uh, flexible enough to also analyze, uh, if you want, uh, even zeroth order method like single point stochastic approximation methods and uh, so on and so forth. Um, the, uh, so far, the only, uh, uh, when we uh, instantiate this algorithm to one of these, uh, to one of these cases, we will assume uh, a stochastic first order oracle, uh, which we'll discuss in the case of explicit assumptions, just to give you an idea. So far, uh, this stochastic first, first order oracle for the gradients will be zero mean and will have bounded variance. Uh, and we will discuss this again in the, uh, in the sequel and will only concern this noise term. So what is the template with which we will uh, analyze this? The important observation and the starting point is that if we just look at, uh, if we isolate uh, 
the gradient term. Uh, this can be written, all these, all these algorithms can be written as, a, an, as an explicit Euler, Euler discretization up to some uh, error. Now, this error would be either zero mean or zero mean plus some bias, depending on the algorithm. But if it is small, then we would like to compare the trajectories of the method to the trajectories of an underlying mean dynamical flow in continuous time. All right. And uh, the idea would be that if the step size of the method is small, whatever that means, uh, and the noise and the various errors are suitably well behaved, then the limit of the uh, of the discrete time Robinson or algorithm would be the same as the long run limit of the underlying dynamics. How to make this uh, into a precise definition? Uh, this is uh, uh, this is where things start getting technical. Um, in the uh, there is a very um, widely used method uh, called the OD method, the order and differential equation method in stochastic approximation, which introduces the notion of an uh, of an APT, an asymptotic skewed trajectory. What is this? Uh, you take your uh, you take your sequence uh, and you introduce a virtual continuous time variable, which is based on the method step sizes, and you uh, introduce this linear interpolation of your um, methods uh, iterates. All right. Now, this linear interpolation, of course, is just a curve in continuous time. And you say that this uh, curve in continuous time is an APT, an asymptotic pseudo trajectory of the underlying flow, when this uh, relatively complicated condition holds. Uh, what does it tell you? However, if, you, uh, if we decipher it uh, term by term, it tells you that if you compare your position on the interpolated curve relative to the position where you would be if you had followed the flow of the underlying mean dynamics starting at the same point as the curve, and if you look at the maximum of these differences and you take the starting point of the curve to infinity, well, then this result is zero. So in slightly less uh, convoluted terminology, uh, this tells you that if x of t, if this, if this curve is an APT of the underlying mean dynamics of the underlying flow, then this means that it tracks the flow, the entire flow, not a particular, not just one trajectory of the flow, but the entire flow with arbitrary accuracy over windows of arbitrary length um, as the starting point uh, goes to infinity. So uh, this is an asymptotic result. All right. So I know that uh, if you're not familiar with this, uh, with this notion, uh, then uh, it can, uh, first of all, uh, appear convoluted, artificial, hard to check, everything. And all these, all these, all these things are true. Uh, what is uh, very useful in this notion is that there exists some very uh, deep uh, criteria uh, under which you can say when a robbins monroe algorithm is an APT of the underlying flow. And then there is another set of criteria which tell you that, which describe the behavior of APTs for a given flow. So by combining these two, uh, uh, these two types of results, we will be able to go from continuous time back to discrete time. Now, um, I I, yes. What is a T capital in the supremum or it is a typo? No, it is not T, it is not a typo. This T capital, this big T, this big T would be what I would say here over a window of arbitrary T. Of, of arbitrary length. So this uh, definition that I wrote here should be interpreted in the sense that this limit is zero for any window length. So just to exp explain again, you look at the maximum difference. Actually, I should, I should 
draw a picture, this will be much simpler. Uh, what happens is that you have your flow. These are your flow lines, and this is your curve. So what you do is you start at a given point, let's say here, x of t, and you compare two points. You compare where you are on the curve after time h and where you would have been if you had started on the flow and you went forward for time h. All right, this is, this is the distance that you study. This is exactly the distance that you see here. And the window length t, it tells you uh, that you want to look at the maximum of this distance over a window of time big T, all right? And if the maximum of this distance as the starting point, as the starting time goes to infinity, goes to zero for every window length, then you say that this blue curve is an asymptotic suited trajectory of the red flow, all right? So when I get yeah. One further question. Uh, so x t, how is it defined in terms of what is the virtual? Could you explain the virtual trajectory bullet? Like yes, I have a discrete yes. process. Yes, 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 okay. yes, yes, yes. Let me explain. So first of all, that my process in general. Remember that it is of the form x n plus one is equal to x n minus gamma n something. All right. So I am viewing these gamma n's, the step sizes as uh, alarm clocks. Uh, the, so gamma n is a step in time. So this virtual time is just the total time that has elapsed after n iterations of the original algorithm. All right. And what this virtual trajectory is, is the following. I take, uh, I take my sequence xn here, xn, xn plus one, so on and so forth. And I interpolate between linearly between all these points. All right. This is my function x of t. And I'm doing this scaling so that at time tau n, my curve is at point xn. Make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. So, but for example, how do you do initial conditions? Like if you want X of T to be something specific, you have to initialize your discrete process, your discrete sequence to, you know, start there, but also so what if it is, uh, I mean, you know, like... This is just your X, so X1. X1 is where, wherever you initialize your algorithm. But if it's like extra gradient, you have to set X minus a half or something as well. So yeah. what I, so, very good question. Uh, extra gradient, optimistic, all this, they have two initializations. Okay, so basically in order to start either extra gradient or, uh, or, um, uh, or uh, optimistic gradient, you basically need only an initial condition and an initial leading gradient. All right, that is what will start your, your algorithm. But this for the definition of an APT is irrelevant because what we're interested in is we have some algorithm which has somehow, based on some initial conditions, generated a sequence Xn. Given the sequence Xn, we construct this interpolated uh, virtual trajectory, X of t, and we give the definition of what an APT is based on, uh, on this interpolated sequence. Gotcha, okay, thanks. All right. So this is, this is actually, uh, this uh, slide always uh, causes, um, uh, 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 causes question because I realize it is uh, a very, uh, a very delicate and uh, a very weird concept. Uh, so if you have any more questions, please, uh, please feel free, um, and be assured that we will not, uh, we will use the notion of what an APT is in the SQL, but mostly as a black box. But if you have any more question about what it is, I'll be happy to answer them. All right, um, so, okay. So let's start, uh, okay, so I'm running out of time. It's okay, I'll manage. Uh, now, 
Very, uh, very quickly, as I was saying, uh, the first question I would like to answer is when is a sequence generated by Robbins Monroe algorithm an APT? And here we will have two types of condition. The first type of condition has to do with uh, base type assumptions which concern F and its behavior towards infinity. Uh, and these, uh, these have to do with the primitives of the problem. The other type of condition now is when we really now need to start looking into the statistics of the noise process. And these are three types of condition. First, that the bias goes to zero with probability one, uh, that it is summable when coupled with the step size, and also that the noise is square summable when coupled with the step size. Under these conditions, which are implicit, hence the name implicit, impl here, this is what it implies. We know that if all these conditions hold, then the generated sequence is an APT with probability one. The problem is that, of course, that these conditions are implicit, so they are not verifiable. So in order to get uh, an explicit, uh, explicit conditions from this, uh, well, this is where we need to start uh, using assumptions from the actual oracle that is producing stochastic gradients. And our assumptions here are, as I said, simply that the oracle uh, is zero mean and returns us uh, uh, gradients with finite variance. If we have this type of oracle and we have any step size between one over n and one over square root of n, basically, which can be made as, a, which can be relaxed, but uh, it's fine for our purposes, then we have the same result, namely that xn any Robbins Monroe algorithm gives rise to an APT of the mean dynamics. So that's one part of the equation. The other part of the equation will be to see what the uh, what type of convergence properties the APT, how we can use these discrete, uh, these uh, these discrete to continuous uh, comparison result. And uh, here uh, is when things become. Uh, quite complicated. In the minimization setting, uh, we have a we can obtain a very simple, very straightforward description of these of the long run limits of uh, of APTs, precisely because we have a gradient flow in uh, minimization problems. All right, uh, and by leveraging this this property, uh, you can uh, the these were the most foundational uh, results of stochastic approximation theory was that you can show that all Robbins Monroe methods converge to the critical set of the uh, underlying objective function. And using it, uh, using the, this, this type of results, you can also show that uh, this method avoids spurious uh, or saddle point, uh, spurious saddle points. Uh, First, P. Mantle showed this for hyperbolic uh, functions. Then, uh, work by Getal showed this uh, for a second order, for convergence to second order optimal points in the stochastic regime. Then, work by Lee and co uh, by Jason and co authors in the deterministic case, et cetera, et cetera. So, the basic question that I want to answer in the five ish minutes that remain is whether this intuition carries over to mean max optimization problems, specifically whether we have convergence to unilaterally stable critical points and or whether we avoid spurious non-equilibrium uh, sets. And uh, here, to dovetail with the previous talk, the, th the problem, of course, is that in mean max problems, we don't have a potential. We, it is a, we no longer have a gradient flow, and things can be arbitrarily complicated. So we need a different notion of criticality. And we need to introduce a range of, uh, of definitions of invariant sets. Uh, so uh, just to clarify, an a set is invariant for the mean dynamics whenever its image, well, remains the same. It is attracting where, when it attracts nearby orbits and it is what we call internally chain transitive or ICT when it is invariant and it contains no proper attractor. Why are the sets, uh, well, sets like that would be, could be limit cycles or uh, heteroclinic networks like that. These are all ICT sets. So they can be really quite complicated. 
but their importance lies in the following base result that with probability one, any Robbins Monroe algorithm will converge to an ICT set of the mean dynamics. Uh, of course, this, this was the classical result. This relies on these implicit conditions that uh, are difficult to verify. Uh, there is an explicit barrier. Uh, there is an explicit variant of this result that if we have these uh, finite second moments uh, for the uh, variance of the oracle, then with probability one, the sequence generated by any Robbins Monroe algorithm will converge. Uh, so, and in particular, with, from any of the algorithms that we discussed, will converge to an ICT set of the underlying mean dynamics. All right. Good news, bad news. Uh, good news is that uh, you can show that these points, whenever uh, whenever you have convergence, you can never have convergence to a uh, sort of an unstable uh, point or an unstable periodic point, a uh, periodic orbit, meaning uh, you can never have convergence uh, if uh, to, uh, to a point or to a periodic orbit which has an unstable critical manifold. This is, in a sense, the direct analog, the direct analog of the sudden point avoidance result that we have for, uh, for the minimization setting. Um, uh, modulo the fact, of course, that here in the minimax setting, we could have more, much more complicated sets that we would like to avoid, like like periodic orbits and the like. So looking back, we have one result, result that tells us that we, as in the minimization case, we have conversion to ICT sets. And in the minimization case, case ICT sets and components of critical points coincide. And we have avoidance of unstable periodic orbits, just as we have avoidance of strict saddle points in the minimization framework. So is there a fundamental difference between min and min max problems? Um, well, the problem in these two statements is not this one. This is actually, this is actually the stronger one. This is the, this is the good news of the, uh, of the whole thing. Uh, and uh, the bad news is that ICT sets could actually be uh, spurious uh, attractors. So um, I will jump forward uh, and uh, then uh, if there are questions, I will go back to this. What I want to say is that if we were to examine, to go back to the original bilinear game, almost bilinear game that we studied, which has uh, a, uh, this simple bilinear uh, uh, term plus a very, very, an, an arbitrarily small perturbation. Um, it is not easy. It is not easy. There's a lot of uh, uh, work needed here uh, based uh, on computing a quantity called the Alexander polynomial of uh, uh, associated to this, uh, to this objective. Uh, but what you can show is that uh, this objective function has a critical point uh, at the origin and a stable limit cycle. And because the system is pl planar by Poincaré Bendixson, you know, and because this point is unstable, you know that this limit cycle is going to be, is going to be attracting almost all, uh, almost all uh, initial conditions. What is the result? The result is that if you have, and the general result is that if you have an attractor, then any sequence generated by this entire Robert Monroe scheme of algorithms will converge to this attractor with arbitrarily high probability. And of course, again, there are two versions of this result, one for implicit type conditions and one for explicit Type conditions, which covers all of the um, all of the algorithms that we that we saw. All right, and it is these these convergence to attractors uh, results that you can establish for the entire gamut of uh, Robbins Monroe algorithms. That is actually the bad news 
in the process. Why? Because all these algorithms share the same underlying mean dynamics. And because the mean dynamics exhibit a spurious attractor, this shows you that all these Robbins Monroe algorithms, you, they have no choice. They will all converge to this spurious, they will all be trapped in this spurious, uh, in this spurious limit cycle, no matter what you no matter what you do. You might try to introduce more refined extra gradient or optimistic uh, or optimistic tweaks. You might introduce uh, very finely tuned uh, step sizes or even adaptive step sizes. This doesn't matter because you have this mapping from uh, continuous to discrete time given by APTs. And because you can determine the internally chained transitive sets of the underlying mean dynamics, this, sh so this shows you that whenever you have such an attractor, uh, you will never be able to escape it with any algorithm that falls in this generalized Robbins Monroe template. So just to conclude, uh, if you want, uh, this is the, uh, these are some of the key takeaways that I wanted to stress with this, uh, with this talk that uh, first order, uh, Robbins Monroe mean max method, yeah, uh, you in the non-monotone, non-convex concave setting, you may have limit points that are neither stable nor attractive. And also that bi the bilinear games that we uh, love to study may actually be very bad representative case studies for the development of a min max algorithmic uh, tools because uh, at least this entire range of uh, this very wide range of uh, first order algorithms cannot avoid spurious non equilibrium sets with positive probabilities. And uh, if we want to uh, do better, uh, if we want to go beyond these, uh, these traps, then uh, we should probably bear in mind, at least this is, uh, this is my, uh, my belief, uh, that we need uh, radically different approaches if we are to hope to achieve uh, strong convergence results be, uh, beyond the uh, convex concave setting. Uh, and of course, all this, uh, this is, uh, perhaps a deeply personal belief to be discussed, but uh, I think I'll uh, stop here because I think I've exceeded my welcome. So thank you, Panayoti. Um, are there any questions in the thank room you. or uh, Zoom? Let me start with one. So uh, I guess, so in Manolis' talk, we saw some dynamics that actually are guaranteed to converge to uh, critical points uh, of some kind. So I guess this must avoid your theorem, right? Correct? I I saw them too. I want to, uh, I am very, very interested to pick, uh, to pick uh, both your brains uh, about this. Uh, what I what I could tell, for, well, first of all, they are second order dynamics. All right. So since they are second order, because you're uh, preconditioning everything with a with a Hessian, uh, these do not fall into uh, the uh, the Robbins Monroe first order framework that this talk was about. Now, uh, that being said, uh, I wasn't super clear uh, in Manoli's presentation on the first step where we uh, where we somehow use a line search to find an optimum uh, and uh, things like that. Um, what I would like to say uh, for that is that um, two things. First of all, if we have access to uh, to an approximate minimization oracle, then all bets are off. Okay, because there are actually uh, results um, that uh, uh, similar to the one you, uh, you, uh, that Manol is presented that tell you that if you have an access to an approximate minimization oracle, uh, then, you can, um, then you can establish convergence to critical points. The second thing I wanted to say is that um, um, Actually, let me let me stay let me stay here because the second thing will be will take some time to explain. So uh, this will derail the question. So let me let me stop there. So 
two elements. First of all, it is second order. Secondly, it needs access to uh, to, a to a maximization oracle. So this is where the theories become compatible. Yeah. The initialization is not exactly access to a minimization oracle, it's just um, solving a lower dimensional problem of the same sort. But I guess okay. maybe it gets too technical, so let's postpone that for now. Okay. So going back going back now to the... I, I will try to focus in a <clears throat> hopefully simple problem, strongly convex, strongly concave, and I give you access to a noised version of uh, your gradient. Uh, yeah. Do we have any method that will converge? Yes or no? Because from the discussion here, uh, I was a little this, bit confused. This is, this, is, this, is super, this is a super simple problem. Because you said strongly, uh, strongly, uh, strongly convex concave, right? Right, right. OK, so very nice. ICT set is the unique solution of the problem. Everything will, all these algorithms. Okay. Will convert. Uh, will, uh, will converge. Not a second question now. Do we have uh, from the theory uh, of uh, Robbins, Monroe, and Benaim uh, rates of convergence about uh -huh. that? No, uh -huh. uh, uh, we do not. Uh, the theory. Uh, the this theory is deeply asymptotic in na nature. Uh, and uh, there is uh, uh, there is a very um, strong reason for this, which is the following: in a minimization in the minimization framework framework, or whenever we just have uh, whenever we just have only critical points that we want to converge, and we have no spurious attractor of the sort, then it is very easy to define a merit function. Uh, meaning, uh, you know, uh, as uh, as in uh, as in yesterday's talk, either the gap function or the gradient norm squared or what have you, which uh, when minimized uh, establishes convergence to a critical point. Fine. Here, when you have uh, when you have an attracting a trapping limit cycle, well, then there is no stationarity there. There is no vanishing gradient there. There is no gap function. Basically, there is no. Uh, there is no standard merit function that you can use to uh, uh, to establish a convergence certificate and say, um, uh, except possibly something very generic like uh, Hausdorff distance to to a set. Now Hausdorff distance to a set is extremely complicated, so you cannot use this. But uh, from uh, from Conley's construction, uh, you know that every attractor admits a local Lyapunov function. Very difficult to construct, but for this Lyapunov, for this Lyapunov function, it is possible to, um, uh, to, uh, to establish race. So to sum up my answer to your question, yes, it is possible to get rates for a metric, which is not uh, very easy to certify in, uh, uh, in general. Which, however, I would have to say is sort of the same problem that you have with variational inequalities, because the gap function that we all uh, like to use in variational inequalities, this is not a, this is not a performance metric that we, that we can actually evaluate. So if I could just give you a point x, I cannot tell you what gap, I cannot calculate gap of x. I may, I may have guarantees for gap of x, but I cannot calculate gap of x without solving another variational inequality. Does this answer your question? Right. So very nice talk, and uh, I really like the, this unified theory of different algorithms in the robbins monroe framework. I was just wondering, like, uh, it seems to to suggest that all these like different algorithms have similar dynamics, but uh, I think that the, the key difference among these algorithms should be like their ICT set might be different, right? But is this captured in in the in the result here? This this is actually exact. Uh, Thanks for the great question. I uh, I couldn't have engineered this uh, uh, this question. Uh, actually, this is the, um, the 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 crux of the matter. The ICT set is not algorithm dependent. It is flow dependent. So, since all these algorithms 
are mapped to the same flow, are, a, are APTs of the same flow, the only thing that counts is the ICT sets of the underlying flow. And it is for this reason that at least generically in, uh, in non-linear min-max problems, uh, all these algorithms have the same, uh, have the same uh, behavior. Does this, uh, yeah, does this answer? Yeah. Sure, yeah, but it's, it's just a, uh, because my impression is always like different algorithms, right? They should have different dynamics and they should have different ICT sets. Some might have more, sp more spurious, you know, non-equilibrium sets. Maybe some have larger, right? Some have smaller. I, I feel like maybe the reason here is because there was this bias term, right? And then mm -hmm. you have this, uh, Unifying the assumption on this 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 bias term, like how it converges to zero, and that might have you know, so makes these algorithms non-differentiable from each other. Um, <clears throat> let me let me try and uh, and give you uh, an answer first of all, because I um, at least I think I understand where you're coming from because mm -hmm. we know that these algorithms, if we if we work on the deterministic case and on a bilinear problem, they do have different behaviors. So okay. there, is no, there is no way of going around this fact. Okay, for sure. Uh, so um, if I, uh, would it be correct to interpret your question as, so since this happens in the deterministic regime, how can you claim that they have the same ICT sets? Yes. Would it be a correct interpretation? Right, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, so great. The, uh, this is a slide that I didn't show, uh, but uh, indeed what happens is that uh, in the bilinear case, the, the actual dynamics are uh, or what is called the Poincaré recurrent. What this means is that the, uh, sorry, uh, uh, what this means is that you have basically a foliation of the, uh, of the state space into these joint non-isolated periodic orbits. And what happens in this case is that uh, all, every individual of these pe periodic orbits is Lyapunov stable. None of these orbits is attracting. And so uh, as a consequence of this, every annulus containing the origin in uh, the standard minimax game XY is an ICT set. So, in this, in the bilinear case, you have a degenerate structure. You have so many, the ICT sets of the underlying flow are completely degenerate. So in that case, you lose predictive power. But there is, uh, there is a counter to this, which is known as the kupka smale theorem, which tells you that this type of Poincaré recurrence, this, this type of recurrent behavior on the, uh, of, uh, that you observe in bilinear games is actually uh, uh, is, uh, is actually meager in the bare category sense, meaning that in the entire space of min-max uh, min -max problems, uh, only uh, this behavior occurs only, uh, only on a meager set, meaning on a countable union of nowhere dense uh, sets. So this, uh, this is why, uh, this is one of the reasons that I'm saying that I believe that the behavior, the difference that we see uh, for different algorithms, gradient type or extra gradient type in, mo in merely monotone, in bilinear game games is actually bad for build building intuition in the beyond the monotone setting. I see, yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. So this sparked a lot of... Uh interest your talk so thank you very much in the interest of time let's postpone further questions uh, thank you very much uh, panayoti thanks everyone hi uh, also panayotis i believe is coming to berkeley at some point so uh, mid-march excuse me mid-march mid-march mid okay so yes. we'll have the chance to interact with him uh, when he comes thank you hi everyone <laughs>